Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for you Minnesota Vikings. I'm your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin cannon string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts around the internet, most notably from theathletic.com. He is Mr. Useful Human, Arif Hassan. Arif, for a team that was undefeated going into this game, I feel like the Cardinals were about as inconsistent on defense as you possibly could have been. Yeah, no, for sure. And and the thing that like bothers me the most about that is just that there was not going to be a lot of mystery about what the Packers were going to try to do. They were out their top two receivers. Uh, they lost their tight end halfway through the game. They obviously were going to run the ball a lot. They're obviously going to throw short routes a lot. Um, they weren't really going to try to ask a lot of the receivers. And the Cardinals still seemed like fairly baffled by a lot of this and just treated the Packers like they were kind of a normal game plan, normal team, that they would do normal Packer stuff. And it's just like, obviously, that wasn't going to be the case. Absolutely wild approach on defense. It was fun that the most successful thing that they seemed to do all game was by accident when they realized that Randall Cobb might be targeted for a third time for a touchdown. <laughs> right. Like, as somebody who picked up Randall Cobb on the waivers, I was really hoping for that third touchdown, but it it was obvious that that was the only person that Rodgers was going to trust down there, so. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have much to add. Like, Rodgers loves, loves Cobb, right? Obviously, otherwise he wouldn't have played GM to get him there. Moved him from Texas. Yeah, like, the, I, there's no bigger definition of doing someone a solid than manipulating your employer to hire your friend, right, from halfway across the country. I mean, that's it, actually entirely across the country. That That is, obviously, Cobb was going to be a target. Like, that's it. There's no other way to put that. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a bit ridiculous. All right, well, welcome to this episode of Norse Code. Hope you guys are all doing well. We had a bit of an extended, uh, little bit, a little, little bit of an extended break. Hope you guys are all doing well. And we are back to talk about the Cowboys game, which is going to be happening on Sunday night. So we've got that. We've got an interview scheduled and we've got a mailbag. But before we do anything, just want to thank you guys so much for listening to Norse Code. Uh, if you enjoy the show and would like to uh, support us financially, you can do so in one of a couple different ways. You can go to uh, patreon.com slash Norse Code and donate there and get bonus episodes for $3.50 a month. You get bonus episodes. We've got about 40 up, I believe, just about, uh, along with another one here coming up in the next day or so. So hope you guys enjoy that. Uh, you can also go to paypal.me slash Norse Code as well and donate there. That's a, like a one-time donation. Or you can... Uh, be one of the many who has decided that they need to clothe themselves uh, featuring Arif's graven image over at norsecode.threadless.com. There's two designs. One is our logo, and the second is the new Arif Arif. Uh, so check that out. It is fantastic. People seem to be enjoying it. Uh, I keep seeing pictures of it on on Twitter, and every time I do, it makes me laugh. <laughs> it is. It, it's It's absurd. It's it's wild and out of control, and evidently people are into that. So, yeah, I guess buy it. it it's Christmas-themed, <laughs> it's a pun, and it's got your face on it. So why not support the call to personality here at norsecode.threadless.com <laughs> and check it out. Also, just a quick reminder that next week, one week from today, we will be in Arlington, Virginia, over at Ireland's Four Courts in the James Joyce Room. We'll be doing a live show over there in uh, in coordination with the Nova Vikes. Uh, spoke to some of them today on a Facebook post. Looking forward to seeing some of you guys over there. Uh, so check us out. It's starting sometime around 7-ish. Uh, 6.30, you show up or whatever. We'll probably be starting about 7.30 or so. we got a bar back there too. So uh, check us out. Should be a lot of fun. In addition to the giveaways they'll be doing, we will also be giving away a ticket to the Ravens game. So again, if you are interested, check us out. We are really looking forward to this. This one's been circled on our... Uh, on our calendar for a long time, so hopefully this uh, this turns out well. Hopefully we get a bunch of good uh, bunch of good Vikings fans out there for the live show as well. Also, if you happen to be over by James Madison University that weekend, it happens to be homecoming, and Arifa and I are going to be heading out <laughs> to homecoming at JMU. Uh, hopefully, taking a lot of pictures in front of the bulldog. 
uh, and uh, uh, amongst other places. So check us out. That should be a lot of fun as well. All right, let's get into the show itself and let's get into the interview that Arif cut earlier today. Uh, this is an interview with uh, with Landon McCool. He is from Locked On Cowboys and the Best Coast Boys podcast. And this is something that Arif did earlier today. And we'll be back on the other side with the mailbag. I'm here with Landon McCool, who does, uh, who co-hosts the uh, Locked On Cowboys podcast, uh, which unfortunately means we are sharing guests with uh, the Locked On Vikings podcast. There's no way to <laughs> avoid it this week. Uh, how you doing, man? Good, good. You know, it's uh, we're we're getting into out of we're both getting out of the bye this week, so we're, we're yeah, both no, probably that's right, yeah. Excited to see how our teams came out uh, injury wise, and and you know, obviously see how they are going to play for the second half of the season. Yeah, no, for sure. I think I feel like there's a lot fewer questions about the Cowboys than there are about the Vikings, <laughs> just because you never know who the Vikings are. Uh, but there's there's some like pretty significant, uh, at least in terms of impact, not I guess in terms of numeracy, injury concerns uh, coming out of the bye for the Cowboys, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean beyond obviously the the headline story with Dak and his calf, uh, the Cowboys had several different players that were coming off of IR. Uh, you know that were always scheduled to come off this week of IR. So we've kind of been in sort of a uh, you know practice watch situation to see you know how many of those guys are going to actually make it back on the field, uh, or and how many are are still you know a week or a couple weeks away. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's dive into it. Let's start. I think with the offense, uh, the Cowboys obviously have uh, one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL right now. Seems to be. Uh, top two in the MVP discussion, uh, you know, Dak and Kyler Murray, I think, are probably leading a lot of MVP discussions. Uh, you know, from an EPA standpoint, I guess it's Matthew Stafford, but uh, certainly up there. Um, is this kind of like I feel like, you know, the analytics guys uh, have been kind of on <laughs> Dak Prescott for a little bit, but that that hasn't really been reflected in a lot of the rest of the community. Do you feel like the league as a whole has kind of taken a turn for the positive on Dak Prescott. Yeah, it, it feels that way. I mean, it certainly felt like the the tides, you know, s- seemed to turn a little bit, you know, early at the beginning of last year when he had you know, a series of very very successful outings uh, offensively. Um, and and I think that that kind of opened people's eyes to what the combination of Dak Prescott and Kellen Moore could be. Uh, then obviously the unfortunate injury against the Giants that kind of derailed some things. Uh, but I think you know it, people were kind of uh, looking, ha- keeping an eye out on Dak when the season started to see if he could kind of pick up where he left off. I, I think a lot of people were assuming that you know, and, and just because of the national media, the way they discussed it, that that Dak was going to come in and, and be kind of s- slowed by injuries, uh, you know, due to the the perceived. A shoulder injury and then the, the ankle, obviously. Uh, but you know, those of us who had been out at camp and had been watching him all throughout training camp, you know, were trying to temper our excitement because it, it, it had looked like he was just the same old Dak as he was before the injury. Cool. And and there is an injury concern with Dak uh, here. Obviously, that's like I think the biggest headline. I think was it uh, Mort just uh, tweeted out or uh, Worder Mort retweeted Worder. Uh, Dak Prescott said that he believes the calf injuries were related to the fractured right leg and dislocated an- ankle that ended his season. He said he doesn't want his physical ability to compromise how he plays or limit Kellen Moore as a play caller. Now, reading that without any context for uh, kind of what his trajectory is at the moment, it feels like it would be better for him not to play this week. But, you know, reading a tweet kind of outside of that context doesn't really tell us much about kind of where he feels. What is your sense based off of kind of reading the practice reports um, on on Dak's availability, it feels like he's probably going to play, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have to say, like before today, I would have told you if he's physically able to go, he's going, and and it seems like he is physically able to go just based on what we're hearing. But I will agree that that today's tone and the way Dak spoke, the way uh, you're starting to hear McCarthy speak about it, that they they must be having some sort of consideration to the idea that. Uh, that they're that they that they may want to sit him and, and just kind of give it an extra week with the calf just to make sure this isn't a lingering thing because clearly you know they have 
aspirations towards the end of the season and, and, and playoffs and that sort of thing. And, and you really just don't want this to be a lingering situation. So the Cowboys have a, a three game lead on, on the next team in the NFC East. They can kind of, <laughs> that, that's actually, not who they're competing with at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. So, the, you know, it's, in some ways they feel like they can afford if they needed to, to maybe sit him one more game, even though it's against an NFC opponent who, you know, maybe vying for playoff position later on in the in the year. Um, I, I think that it's it's one of those things where that he could play, but the question is, is it worth the risk to his long term health for the rest of the season that he's react? You know, because these calf injuries. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it on your teams before. De- you know, depending on the position, they can tend to linger and they'll crop up, and suddenly you know you'll be fine for a couple weeks, uh, and then suddenly you'll wake up and 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 you know you can't walk. You're, you're limping, so. Uh, I think that the Cowboys are concerned about that, and so they're kind of monitoring that. And I and I I really do believe that it will be like a Saturday decision because I think they you know he he pushed it really hard at practice. He said he went 100 percent today at practice, and he felt fine. So that to me reads like he's physically able to play. But the question does stand: is it is it prudent for him to play uh, in regards to the rest of the season? Yeah, I think um, I think I saw another. Uh, I think it was a quote from Dak who said. If there was a game this last week, he would have been able to play physically, but he yeah. wouldn't have because of that long-term risk, uh, which I think contextualizes kind of what you were saying in terms of the type of decision that they'll have to make. So if the Vikings see Dak Prescott, they will probably get a quarterback who for that game be 85 to 100% in terms of his physical capability. But the concern is that you could aggravate or you could restrict the recovery of or whatever for that calf. So with that in mind, I mean, what's your take? Obviously you, you haven't like, you know, seen the soft tissue injury or anything like that. Like th- th- <laughs> your take is probably meaningless, but I still want it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, no, I, I went into the locker room and I, and I was twisting his foot around a little bit and asking him what, uh, you no, know, but you're right. I mean, honestly, and, and, and here's the other thing too, is how much of this is, you know, trying to gain a competitive advantage. You know, I, I mean, like here's here's the thing about the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, you know, I'm sure you know, even from the outside, everybody knows we haven't heard from Jerry Jones yet. So I'm sure that Jerry will get on the radio call <laughs> probably later on today and say, "Uh, yeah, D- Dak's definitely playing. Uh, there's no yeah, doubt. he's going to give it away. Uh, it, yeah. it, it, it just completely ruined whatever <laughs> kind of you know mystique uh, McCarthy may be trying to put uh, put over this. But uh, I, you know, look, it, I would say that this seems more than smoke. I, it seems like they are potentially actually thinking about, uh, you know, actually sitting him for this game. I would not have said that yesterday. If, mm-hmm. if we had done this interview yesterday, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have said it. But I, I think the the change in tone. There was a, a little bit of a change in tone today. So I, I think that they are actually considering it. I don't know if they've actually made up their mind. All right. Um, well, let's let's talk about Dak the player then a little bit. So. Uh, I'm taking a look at kind of the the player profile I can kind of generate based off of you know various you know PFF metrics. It sounds like you know he's top eight ish in big time throw percentage. Uh, he's got a couple more turnover worthy plays than um, than the most elite quarterbacks typically do, but it's still fairly low relative, especially given his big time throw rate. Uh, and uh, he's not suffering from too many drops, which is not a surprise given kind of the the receiver core he's got the ability to work with. Um, and, uh, his, his time to throw is not necessarily high. It's not necessarily low. It's on the lower end. Um, so you take a look at this profile, you see somebody that it's hard to pin down kind of a play style, right? Like when you, when you go up against Jameis Winston, you know what you're getting, right? When you go up against Teddy Bridgewater, you know what you're getting. You're getting kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Lamar Jackson, you know what you're getting. Justin Herbert, you know what you're getting. What is Dak's play style? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, he he is kind of a, a unique player to try to kind of nail down a little bit. And, and I think the spectrum that has always been presented that I kind of like is is sort of on the Russell Wilson kind of spectrum. You know, I, I think he's I think he's a guy who is kind of transitioning away from that more towards, you know, a, a guy who is trying to be a pocket passer more exclusively. Uh, you know, obviously the injury is going to affect that as well. Uh, but where I think that Dak is really kind of grown a lot and become a, a, a you know a top five top three quarterback in this specific area is pre-snap reads I think that one thing he's gotten really really good at is getting his team in position 
to uh, you know ha- get success from play to play by putting you know changing the protections, changing the play if necessary. He, he's got very strong command of this particular offense, and I think he understands all the the different tools he has at his disposal to kind of make the adjustments to make sure that any given play is successful. He's, you know, he, he had a lot of experience at setting the, the line calls uh, after Travis Frederick left. And, and, and I think, you know, they were, they had a really close relationship and that kind of helped him, you know, really accelerate that part of his game. And, and since then he, you know, if you watch in, in any kind of pre-snap talk, he is telling everybody what to do. Essentially, he's getting people lined up. He's moving people around, uh, and that's something that you've just seen kind of accelerate a little bit more. And and what and the way that ultimately translates uh, post-snap is that you know he he knows where his answers are, and and I think that sometimes he can find them late in, in ways that we are surprised that he can find it in a, in a, in a mass of, of bodies, and and sometimes he gets out of the pocket uh, and he's using his legs. Uh, not to run, not to necessarily escape, but to change angles and, and to get better, better throwing lanes and that sort of thing. So uh, I think the, the the Dax game is a lot more of a, you know, kind of a developing into. I'm not com- necessarily comparing him to these guys, but developing towards a sort of Peyton Manning, Tom Brady style of of just being in full command of what is happening in the offense and allowing uh, y- y- putting your 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 teammates in best position to, uh, you know, make score points, take the ball and get yak, all all the things that will make your team more successful and and less about, you know, trying to play hero ball, which I think at times you saw with Romo, you know, where Romo was just trying to do it all by himself. And even though he had great players around him, uh, I think Dak is even more so than Romo, a little bit better at kind of being a, uh, a point guard, a distributor, if, if you will. At side note, before uh, I ask my next actually relevant question, <laughs> Romo, Hall of Famer? Man, I mean that's a loaded question to ask a Cowboy fan, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, I gotta get the <laughs> I gotta get that perspective, right? Well, I've always been I, I don't I and I, I wish I could recredit who who came up with this. Um, I've always been of the uh, of the mind that Matt Ryan is the uh, is the line of demarcation, right? Like uh, like anything Matt this Ryan the Hall of Les- Fame Mendoza line. For yeah, you right exactly. Now? Yeah. Anything Matt Ryan and Les is the Hall of Very Good, and like you know, if you win that, if he wins that Super Bowl, maybe you, you're in the consideration. I don't know. I'm of the mind that if Eli Manning's in the in the Hall of Fame, no, we we no, we can't. Let's shelve that, <laughs> right? Because that's an insane discussion. Um, and I, we both know where it's coming from, but yeah. like, let's shelve that and say Eli Manning never existed which obviously is a reality you want to exist in but like let's say eli manning never existed and we're having this discussion about whether or not and it's like it's like a different random giants quarterback that won those super bowls right so you still have to deal with that mess but uh so tom brady only has like seven rings or whatever he has (laughs) um (laughs) yeah just you know that's that's it um but romo still has none right and he still has kind of that history of playoff failure um, you're still kind of trying to figure out how you feel about him, how you feel about Philip Rivers, um, but you know Romo, Romo has like a like among retired quarterbacks, he has like the highest pass rating, something yeah. like that. Like he's he's still got like these in, impressive box score statistics. Um, is he a Hall of Famer? I I think he is. I, I think he is because you know again the the. You know, another thing that I, I wish you I could cannot construct to. an argument about Eli right now. We're not. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm going to avoid the Eli argument here. I, the, the other, you know, the other thing that kind of you know uh, line that you need to pass to get into the Hall of Fame that I like is is how do you tell the, the history of the NFL with or without this player? Right. I, I hate this one. Sorry. I know. I, just, I, I know. Hate that but, line. <laughs> but I, 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 but I, I kind of think that it. I think that Romo belongs simply because you know he was a huge part of that. Two, you know, mid two thousands NFL football had a lot of success. Uh, you know, again, I'm extremely biased, and and, and I and I rec- And if he if he wasn't to get in, I totally would understand it. Uh, but I, yeah, I think he exists hovering right around the line, and I think on any given day, depending on who you're discussing it with, he can be either be above or below that line. And I and I I honestly analytically think 
that I would accept either either side of the argument to be to be straight. All right, before we move on to people currently on the Cowboys, final Hall of Fame question about Tony <laughs> Romo. How I don't know. This is like a fascinating discussion. To me. Yeah. How many quarterbacks that played substantially in that mid two thousands era would need to get into the Hall of Fame before you said, "Wait a minute," and demanded that Romo get in? So obviously, we're getting you know Peyton and Tom, right? Let's bring yeah. Eli Manning back from the dead. He's now in this discussion. Okay. Um, but you've got, you know, Ben Roethlisberger is probably the third one out of that yeah. group that's getting in, right? And yeah. now we're having a discussion that includes players like Matt Ryan, like Eli Manning, like Philip Rivers, like Tony Romo. I'm, am I missing someone who's probably in that discussion too? I mean, Rodgers, but I think that's a given, right? Oh, like, yeah, yeah, Rodgers, yeah. yeah, for sure, for yeah. sure, for sure. I, so, mean, I, mean, like, I can understand as a Vikings fan, not just completely well, dismissing it, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but, okay, so... And, and listen, as a Cowboys so the, fan, I, I'm there with you as well. Yeah, right, so. right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're here, we're here. We're both victims, yeah. We, should, we yeah. can definitely commiserate on that. Uh, so so yeah. those four were get in, and then Roma doesn't get in, and you're fine. So how many people beyond those four, right, I, when you get to Rivers and the other Manning and Matt Ryan, how many before you're like, this is a travesty? I think the the Rivers comparison is very apt, right? Like, I th- because they had similar – I mean, honestly, I think those era Chargers teams and those era Cowboy teams were like, peas and carrots man i mean you know they were like they're twins of each other in a lot of ways so i think if rivers gets in then you're having a i think it's it's time to start banging the table for romo because i think that they're they have similar trajectories their numbers may not be always the same but i think they had similar impact on their teams uh that's probably yeah the eli manning philip rivers which i obviously funny enough how they're tied together right right Uh, i think those are the two that i would that would start you know, really start. Okay, now it's time to start talking Romo. Yeah. All right. So, so he's the fifth quarterback in from that group. You think? Yeah. Or he should probably. Be. That's okay. that's fair. You know. Okay. Let Let's talk about current Cowboys. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> um, should Tony Pollard stutter of Zeke Elliott? Oh man, you're not asking any of the, the easy ones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, look here's 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 my take on Tony Pollard. I think Tony Pollard is his most efficient and the best player taking the amount of carries that he has currently. Uh, yeah, I, that's I, not the question. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I feel like if Dalvin cook only had like 10 touches a game, they'd be some really great touches. But the <laughs> question is, should I, you I, swap the Zeke and Pollard roles? No, I don't think you should. Yeah. I, I, I think that, I, I think that if anything, now that they've sort of adjusted the, the carry, you know, the touch percentage a little bit. And, and and actually what they're really doing is they're they've become much more of a matchup based offense. Uh so I, I you know it's really game specific as to you know how much you should consider you should think about how much Pollard is going to get touches versus Zeke. So I, I do think that Zeke should continue to get the lion's share of snaps and, and I, I do specify snaps as touches because I think I think honestly a, a 50-50 workload as far as touches goes makes some sense to me. But I do think okay. that I prefer Zeke on the field more because I trust him in pass protection. I trust him in in in, in a lot of the other aspects of being on the field and and helping with uh, making D- Dak right because he's just he's a. Uh, you know, for 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 all of his faults in his last few years, and, and he you know he took a couple steps back. I think he's playing as well right now as he has since he was That's a right. rookie. Uh, Zeke has always been one of the smartest players on the team. Uh, he he sits in the quarterback meetings with with Dak. He understands protections better than almost any running back I've ever seen. Um, and, and he's I like think that coming out of Ohio State too. His yeah, he's, al- he's always phenomenal. Always been yeah. that guy. Yeah, and that, that's that's you know was. He's, I think, one of the best balanced backs, you know, as, as a, in skill sets that, that 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 has been around in a long time. Um, so I, I think that there is still value in having him on the field more often than not, if only for the fact that I I prefer to get, have a running back who, if they're going to be getting at least fifty percent of the shares, uh, the, the touches that they're consistently gaining yards, and and Pollard is is kind of boom and bust, especially mm-hmm. as you start to get him more touches. He doesn't quite see it as well as Zeke, but 
he he has obviously that explosion that that Zeke doesn't have. So uh, it is kind of a delicate balancing act there. I just think that there is something about consistently getting positive yards the way Zeke does on on every touch, even when the the blocking breaks down. That is good for the Cowboys' efficiency because they you know honestly. They can't get behind. I mean, they can, but they, they, it, one thing that they have to avoid is, is getting behind of the chains because of their run game. Like that's, that's when, you know, things really, and obviously analytics will tell you that you probably shouldn't even be running <laughs> as much as the Cowboys are in first down. But I, I think that it's, it's helped the Cowboys to stay in positive game scripts and not lose yardage. And, and I think when we've seen Pollard get more snaps, uh, I think we saw it a little bit last year as Zeke started to wear it down. There, it seems like the there's more often there's times where he's getting caught behind the line of scrimmage. He either didn't read it quick enough, he didn't put his foot down fast enough to get north and south, uh, and he's getting uh, gobbled up for for losses in a way that Zeke doesn't really. Zeke is currently second among non quarterbacks in MVP odds, which I mean obviously means he's not going to get it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, yeah. but uh, you know, it's, it's like Derrick Henry, who's like, I don't know, like seventh or whatever in MVP odds. And then, you know, a couple more quarterbacks and then Zeke. Is that, is that would you rank him second among running backs this year? Um, I, I think that MVP is should be given to a running back at this point. <laughs> I mean, I, like Derrick Henry well, is yeah. the only guy. This is, this, is, this is shorthand basically for... Uh, oh, oh, is, is Zeke the second best running back right now? Uh, you know, there's 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 some guys in Cleveland that might have uh, c- conversations about that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a guy I in, in Indianapolis in, that might have yeah. a conversation about that. I, I yeah. mean, honestly, depending on if he's healthy or not, there's a guy in Minnesota that I, I like quite a bit as well. Right. You know, so um, I, I think that if Zeke is is running right and he's healthy, he's as talented as any running back in the league so yeah i think there are definitely times when he's the second best back in the, in the league and it just so happens that the cowboys have another guy who is maybe a, a top 10 running back as well in tony pollard interesting interesting um i mean really really kind words that you said towards kenny wangu even though he hasn't played a snap for the vikings <laughs> yet <laughs> Well, I'm a big fan, so uh, yeah. <laughs> just, just got to get healthy, you know. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> all right, let's let's uh, let's move real quick to tight end before we talk about the offensive line because I want to save receiver for last. Um, Blake Jarwin, playing better than I think a lot of people expected. Playing better than you expected, question mark? I, you know, uh, I, look, I'm a Dalton Schultz fan, and, 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 I, I, and I think that Jarwin uh, has been a guy that has been a receiving threat, uh, a, a guy that they could use as a seam buster, uh, a guy that they can use uh, on the move uh, as a kind of a move tight end who can get open against, uh, you know, as a mismatch player. But... Um, but, he, but he's just never developed as a two-way tight end, and I think mm-hmm. for the Cowboys... They really like having the flexibility of a guy who can do both because it just you know helps to disguise what they're trying to do pre snap. So you know you're not going to like you know be able to tell tendencies just because Jarwin's on the field and and know okay well they probably aren't going to run towards him or not going to use him as a blocker here. I think he's thrived in a tight end two role um, because that allows them to deploy him in such a way that. Uh, you know, it plays to his strengths a little bit. And and Schultz being a guy who probably was a better technical, like if you, if you watch his tape at Stanford, he's like a, a very technical blocker, but he was very undersized. So it took him some a, uh, a while to get up to strength and size to be a, a, a blocker, especially a tight end who's, who can be a point of attack blocker at times uh, to get to that size. Jarwin, you know, never really kind of developed the, the technique side of blocking. And I think he's a bigger body, but he's just not very good at it. I think both of them can catch the ball. Both of them can be receiving threats. I think that the the difference is for for Jarwin is that, you know, it just it never really developed as a blocker, and I think that's going to limit his snaps. It, it's going to be interesting to see what the Cowboys do with Jarwin because clearly Schultz has, has taken over as tight end one. Jarwin's on a contract that he already signed with the Cowboys, so uh, and Schultz is up this year. So are the Cowboys looking to re-sign Schultz and keep Jarwin and Schultz together as, as a kind of a, a combo 
would they potentially trade a, a guy like Jarwin, whose contract is not like prohibitive, even as a tight end too, if, if some team was a tight end, tight end needy and they wanted him. I think Jarwin is an interesting case because I think he has talent. I think he does something that you know is is uh, is is desired in the NFL and being a, a, a tight end receiving threat. Uh, but I think for the way the Cowboys want to play, he he kind of has to be used sparingly because of his limitations as a blocker. So if the Cowboys were only allowed to field 11 players for an entire game, you'd rather mm-hmm. it be Schultz out there? Yeah, I mean, I think you know he's the more rounded player. And I think up until recently, you know, the, the, the knock was, well, Schultz isn't really the same kind of receiver as Jarwin is. But I, I think if last year proved anything, uh, that's not the case. And, and then, you know, coming into this year, obviously he's had a fantastic year. So, uh, yeah, I think at this point, I, I think Schultz right now is playing, you know, there's that top end group of three or four guys who are the elite tight ends in this league. I think Schultz is playing right underneath them um, just, just based on this year. Uh, and, and we'll see if, if that continues, if he can continue to grow. But uh, I, I think the Cowboys have been really good at developing tight ends over the years. Uh, and Schultz is just starting to kind of develop, come into his own now. All right. Now to the offensive line. Uh, I believe Lyle Collins will take over at right tackle. Is that right? <sighs> Again, the tough oh questions. Boy. Yeah, oh I do. We, we don't I was, know. So I, I had a tough question lined up. I didn't realize this one was also tough. Well, it, it, it has been tough because the assumption going into the week is yes, obviously. Leo Collins is a fantastic right tackle. We we think he's one of the best in the league. But but at the same time, he hasn't played a lot Williams? of football in the last oh, okay. last few uh, last few years. I mean, last two years. Sure. You know, because he had the suspension. He right. he missed all of last year because of the injury. Um, Terrence Steele is actually who's playing right tackle for them right now. Um, and right. he's been more than serviceable. He was a guy who played for the Cowboys last year and was terrible. Absolutely terrible. Uh, yeah, and the Cowboys, that. you know, the Cowboys fans were begging for him to get taken off the field. Uh, and, and the coaching staff insisted that he stay out there. I mean, the Cowboys dealt with incredible injuries on the, on the offensive line. It's not like they had a lot of choice, but, but the cow- coaching staff continued to support him he spent the uh, the off season working with Duke Merriweather, uh, and you know came back in. He won off season awards uh, for being the guy, you know, the guy that was in the building the most. Uh, and when Lael Collins got suspended, you know, most of Cowboys Nation was just like, "Oh boy, we're screwed." I mean, you know, <laughs> we, Ty mm-hmm. and Zeki, or and then we found out that it was Terrence Steele that was starting, and everyone got even more panicked. And then suddenly the Cowboys win five straight games with him. And, and Terrence Steele, you know, may not be a great pass protector, but he's out there burying dudes in the run game. Um, so, you know, we still expected that Lael Collins would get his job back, you know, this coming get back this week. And this was the week that obviously that that everyone was targeting for that. But again, kind of a, a lot like what, you know, the, the Dak in his calf situation was, the tone was very different from the coaching staff and front office folks than we expected. And, and I can't really tell if it's, you know, tr- trying to send a message to Lael Collins because they probably blame a lot of what happened last year on him because he could have gotten the hip surgery during the off season. He came in out of shape, so because of those two reasons, they had to basically bent, you know sit him for a year on IR after the surgery. And then I don't know if you've actually followed this whole suspension thing with that happened with him, but he got it for for missing tests which should have been just a two game suspension, but then he exacerbated the whole situation by trying to bribe, but uh, allegedly trying to allegedly, bribe yeah. the, the, the tester and, and trying to miss more. So he ended up making it five games. So I think the front office and the it's coaching so funny, staff man. is, is not very thrilled with him. So I, I do. Th- part of me wonders if this is all just, uh, you know, kind of just teaching Lael a lesson, but then again, I mean, you know as well as I do ball, how ball coaches are. They may not want to break up the continuity. They, the Cowboys have won five straight games with Steele. And like I said, Lael Collins has not played a lot of football in the last two years. So I don't know that they're like really chomping at the bit to switch horses midstream. That was entirely too many uh, analogies there. I, I apologize. I no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Don't <laughs> worry about it. Switching horses midstream. Right. Uh, yeah, so, chomping at the bit. <laughs> <laughs> too, too many horse metaphors. Sorry about that. Well, okay. Let's. Uh, okay. So this was the actual. Inter- I shouldn't even say tough. Interesting question. Why in my timeline am I seeing a debate over whether or not Connor Williams is better than Terrence Steele, even though they play different positions? Oh, God. Well, 
because ultimately the other interesting aspect of all of this is that not only – so, you know, at the beginning of the week, the uh, the uh, PR team releases uh, a depth chart. I don't, know if they, I don't know if they do this with the Vikings too. I, I assume they, this is an NFL-wide thing, but maybe they don't. Um, and, and it basically, I'm sure it, the PR more, team updates the depth chart on the, on the website, but we never check. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and, and honestly, it's about that useful because it's, it, it's never, you know, the names are often misspelled, you know, they, they'll call a defensive tackle, a defensive end or, you know, things like that. Uh, but on the depth chart starting the week, uh, when we started doing, you know, a lot of these interviews, uh, with, with coaches and that sort of thing, Lael Collins was not only listed as the backup right tackle. But he was also listed as the backup left guard. Now, and I don't know if you remember, but Leo Collins played left yeah. guard when he was a rookie. Year, rookie. Right? Yeah, yeah, and he wasn't he wasn't great at it. I, I think there was a misconception that 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 he was really really good. But I well, that that time, was back when we were having a discussion that the that the Cowboys might have. They're in the running to have the best offensive line of all time. And holy crap, I can't believe they got Lyle Collins for a song. Um, a first round talent. Now you just fit him in at left guard. It's fine. He's going to end up taking over. Who was it at the time? Doug Free? I don't know. Uh, he's going to take over the right tackle position long yeah. term, and and they're going to have another one of those all decade offensive lines, which you know, the best laid plans. But- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, <laughs> trust me. I'm, I'm a Cowboys fan. I know all about best laid plans. Uh, yeah. No. I, I, I and, and you nailed it. Like that's that was the plan, and ultimately he was okay as a left guard, but not like you know superstar level. Certainly not you know, the, the whispers of, Oh, this was a first round pick that the Cowboys got for nothing as, as a left guard. Right. Mm-hmm. He then moves, he, because he had never played guard before and he played, you know, he, he played on the, on the left side too. But so then he moves to right tackle. It takes him a little while, but ultimately I think it was what, like th- two or three years ago. Um, you know, he started at right tackle and he faced like a murderer's row. I think if I remember correctly, we faced like, Three or two or three of the AFC uh, West teams uh, to start the season. It was Von Miller, J- Joey Bosa. Uh, it was just that he had like you know left end after left end that he had to face, and he and he played fantastic, and he, he shut them out completely. Uh, and I think that the, since then he's only gotten better. But the problem is, since then he's also you know uh, delayed his hip surgery to the, to the point where he ended up having to do it in season, so he missed the whole season last year. The drug test stuff. You know, it's just it's it's never been about talent with him, especially a tackle. It's always been about taking care of business off the field to make sure he can make it on the field. I love the idea that after signing Lyle Collins, if you told Cowboys fans, hey, this murder thing, not even remotely a thing. Don't worry about it. And he's as talented as they say. But man, are you gonna be sick of this guy? <laughs> <laughs> like, like if you if you had said those two things and then said the third thing, that would have been kind of confusing, right? Yeah, and and it's it's always confusing when it plays out like that too, because because <laughs> because you hear it and then you're like, well, what does that even mean? And then you live through it, you're like, oh, that's what that means. Okay, got it. <laughs> glad, glad I learned that life lesson, you know. All right, let's skip over uh, perhaps the best guard of the past decade, Zach Martin, and talk about Tyler Biadash. Uh, he sucks, right? Like he's just bad. Yeah, I mean he's not great, and I think you know ultimately they were trying to figure something out to, uh, and we weren't exactly sure. Um, it, we, they were trying to figure something out a little bit later in training camp where Connor Williams might be able to you know kick inside there. Uh, really, the the one complaint I have about this team is probably the way they handled the center, center position because it's not that I think that Biotish was going to suck. I, I I actually thought he would be okay, and he may still. I think he's played better lately, and a lot of it is just needing reps, you know, just needing to play more. But, uh, you know, he's undersized. He's getting bullied a lot. They tried to move Connor Williams into center, you know, throughout training camp, but they did it kind of late in the game, and he really struggled to get his snaps right, you know, because he hasn't been playing center. He's been playing guard. Uh, and, and, and the other thing that is – Complaint worthy, I think, is that the reason one of the reasons they wanted Connor Williams to slide into center is because that would open up an opportunity for well known Dallas Cowboys fullback and tight end Connor McGovern uh, <laughs> to to slide into uh, to the left guard and let Williams play uh, center. 
Um, but Connor McGovern himself played an entire year at center in Penn, at Penn State, and they didn't ever try that. And now, now they're trying to get Connor McGovern to take snaps there. I, I think maybe with the idea that eventually, if he gets it right, that he may take Tyler Biotish's spot. Uh, but I mean, it's just kind of a little bit late in the game for it. So, uh, to, yeah, to kind of answer your question, Biotish has been a problem at, at times. He's gotten better. I think with snaps, he might continue to get better. But I, I don't know if he's the answer there long term, and especially with, in this situation where. You feel like you've got two guys that are are better overall football players in, in Connor Williams and Connor Mc, the Connors Connor Williams right. and Connor McGovern, uh, but it's kind of difficult to figure out the configuration to get them both on the field. Is it weird that Connor McGovern is neither the best Connor offensive lineman on the roster nor the best Connor McGovern offensive <laughs> lineman in the NFL? <laughs> that sounds like a coffee talk conversation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <discuss>. <laughs> <laughs> Connor McGovern is neither the best Connor or the best Connor guards. Discuss. Uh, it is weird. I mean, yeah. And listen, trust me. It, it took you know, as a someone who speaks about the Cowboys every day. When they drafted him, uh, the, you know the first month was fraught with me screwing up between the two Connors. Um, it, look, I, I think the problem is is that Connor McGovern uh, kind of had a redshirt year his his rookie year because he, he he was dealing with an injury. He didn't get a lot of playing experience, so they haven't had a, a lot of opportunities to look at him. Um, but when they've put him in there. He's a f- much more physical player than I think that Connor Williams is, but he's—I don't think he's as technically sound. So they've been trying to find ways to uh, uh, to mix him in. And to their credit, I love the way that they're mixing him in. You know, having him play fullback, having him play mm-hmm. tight end. I—I I mean, look, you guys may bear witness to the first Connor McGovern carry. It, I, it's gonna happen at some point. <laughs> he's, he's, he's gonna carry the ball. So uh, I, I can't wait until the way that that does happen. All right, Tyron Smith, still a leader past his prime. Oh, yeah, still elite. I mean, and honestly, that's changed this year. I mean, I don't know if you followed that at all, but, you know, for the last few – I mean, I'm sure you've, you've been aware of the fact for the last few years – it's it's felt like he's falling off a cliff and and just he's missing time he's having in, he's having problems even when he was on the field he was struggling with his neck and his back but what happened last year is that you know because he was out for the season so early he was finally able to have neck surgery that he's been putting off for apparently up to 6 seasons 6 Jesus years Christ. yes just because he never got enough there was never a time the, the surgery was so serious that you know the, the the recovery time was never was so long that he couldn't do it in the offseason because then he would have to delay the start of of his offseason regimen but he kept on putting it off so he finally had it uh you know when he got put on IR last year and he took the cowboy collar off that big collar that he had off and it's just like old Tyron Smith is back it's crazy and i, I wow. you know it's, it's it's especially since you hear that old adage uh, no one's ever used to have a bad back. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I mean, I don't know if it's he's passed it, but he certainly is not dealing with the kind of situations that he was dealing with before where he was constantly getting stingers, constantly dealing with, you know, maybe sleeping on a bed wrong, having a back problem, you know, or, or just, you know, that kind of chain of of issues that all stem from that kind of neck back chain, right? It, it just feels like he's, uh, he's reached the fountain of youth. I, I don't know if it'll last forever, uh, but it, it certainly has been absolutely fantastic to watch this season. Uh, final question before we go to wide receivers. Should the Cowboys just move Zach Martin to right tackle to deal with Daniel Hunter? You know, what's the, what's the, build the whole plane out of Zach Martin's, you know, <laughs> if, if that was an option, like, yeah, I mean, it, like, please, like, I, I don't know if, you know, they, they do that. I mean, I don't know if there's ever been in high school or college, uh, a a uh, matchup know, uh, offensive lineman. Uh, yeah, an offensive lineman who's a shadow, <laughs> a shadow guard, right? Like <laughs> he's just, he's just, he just wherever he waits for wherever you line up, and then he, he motions. I mean, obviously the the rules wouldn't quite uh, allow for that for because of motion and that sort of thing. But uh, you know, I think I, I certainly, I certainly not against it. I, I look, I personally think that that Lael Collins will end up starting. Uh, I, I just, I they're just, they're just playing some games to send a message. I, yeah, I mean. I, 
It, hey it, man, I don't, maybe that, you shouldn't have appealed this. <laughs> yeah, that, that 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 belief took some hits today, I think, and it actually took some hits yesterday. But uh, I still am holding out that that the Cowboys are not going to put the lesser of the two tackles out there against Daniel Hunter. Okay, fair enough. Uh, all right, let's talk about these wide receivers first. If fully healthy, would you rather have Cedric Wilson or Michael Gallup? Uh, Michael Gallup. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, know, I, I know. That was pretty easy, actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the thing is, is that y- you're you're making a fair point because Cedric Wilson is an incredibly underrated player, and the fact he, he can literally do anything you ask him to do, and 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 that's incredibly valuable. And to have a guy who can be that for your team regularly, and then you know when you lose someone like Michael Gallup, can step up and function incredibly well as a wide receiver three, like that. That's that's an incredibly valuable piece to have for sure. Uh, and, and, and there were people on this team, uh, not, not on the team, but you know, in Cowboys fandom throughout training camp that was trying to cut Cedric Wilson because I think he, you know, he makes no, like a, a million five Wilson. or something like that, you know, he, cause he, he has a contract. <laughs> I mean, it was something ridiculous. It was something so stupid. I was just like, guys, like, no, absolutely not. Don't do that. Like let's, it's just let's save some money. Let's well, you know, here's my thing. And, and, and look, th- before we kind of wrap up on offense, I think the thing that makes Dallas so dangerous is that this is a team that is extremely well versed in this offense. There's a lot of continuity across the board on this team, all the way down to like a Cedric Wilson and Noah Brown, who are wide receiver four and five. You know, and and I think that you know trying to th- there's value in having these guys who can just come in as your backups and do everything that you want. And 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 like I said, both of them are also incredible special teams players. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm not trying to cut uh, uh, Cedric Wilson for no offense to Malik Turner, but Malik Turner and or someone you know that, that that's like uh, no uh, full offense to Malik Turner. Come yeah. on, not, <laughs> yeah, come full on. offense to Malik Turner. Uh, yeah, I just I, I think that there's th- those guys have incredibly valuable roles in a in a team building sense, and and I, they shouldn't be avoided. If if Cedric Wilson wore thirteen and Michael Gallup wore one, would your opinion change? Would Cedric Wilson just be a worse player? Uh, you know the the Cedric Wilson changing to number one that happened this year, and so like it feels like it feels so new still that I still don't quite understand how it's it uh how he's he's wearing it appropriately. But I, I think that yeah, I I do think I'm a big believer in numbers uh, change perception as well. Yeah, uh, and, and I think that he he looks good in the one for sure. It's just it odd that he's one. wide receiver four, right? Like that he's number one. <laughs> he's wearing the one. Yeah, it's it's yeah. just very weird. Yeah. All right, um, and we spent a lot of time on the offense. I'm sorry. Let's let's well, talk. Yeah, I mean, we're Cowboys. I mean, that's the, we, we like to talk. <laughs> we like to talk a lot about the offense, and you know, kind of just breeze past the defense if we can. <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's talk about that defense. <laughs> um, let's start real quick on safety backer Keanu Neal, Jabril Cox, <laughs> also a safety backer. Um, wh- okay, what is happening at any linebacker spot? <laughs> now, now that uh, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, what what is happening just generally at the, at the linebacker spot? Um, you know, look, I mean, I the think— The Cowboys have the lightest linebackers by listed weight in the NFL. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it certainly didn't get— uh, uh, it, it certainly didn't get better when they when they released uh, Jalen Smith, right? right? I mean, so, yeah, right now, the only guy who's got any heft uh, in the linebacker core at all is is Leighton Vander Esch. And it's still, Boy. it real, really still feels like they're doing their best to try to keep him off the field at this point. Um, I I think that that's just the way that they want to play. Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously Dan Quinn has a history of, of using lighter linebackers. He likes speed at the position. Um, I, and I also think that it, having before when we had Jalen and, and Layden, it, it provided some flexibility because they were kind of shifting the fronts that they were using, you know, in a, in a I, I guess, surprising way. I mean, I, you know, that was the one thing when Quinn got hired. Yeah. We, we the, expected a classic. Yeah. Cover three. You've got a front four. Yeah. And we're not yeah, getting the, that. The, yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's the thing, right. Is like, it wasn't, it, I mean, look, it's, Okay, we want to get back to close to what Marinelli was doing because the Nolan situation was was problematic, um, and, you know. And then the the two names that we heard were Quinn um, and Gus Bradley, 
right? And and, and when you hear those two Jesus names together, oh it's a very God. clear line of what you're going to get, right? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. very, it's like, oh, okay, two C- Seattle, uh, uh, Tampa 2 guys. Okay, cool. I guess we know exactly what we're getting. And, and again, it, that is obviously so close to what the Cowboys were playing previous to, to Nolan as well. So it, there was a lot of expectation that, man, we're going to see a lot of middle of the field close coverage and it's going to be a bunch of very predictable stuff. And then, you know, I, I, I go out to training camp every year and, and I, I'm a couple practices deep and I'm watching them and I'm like, man, this doesn't look the same. This looks weird. This looks different. And the fronts, the fronts are what I noticed immediately. The, 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 the number of different fronts that they use, uh, the way that they move people around uh, up front um, uh, it was, it was surprising. And then, you know, I don't know, um, how much of the first few games of the Cowboys you saw, but they were playing like quarters coverage and on, on early downs and, and they're doing stuff that, you know, that you would, you would expect Brandon Staley maybe to do, mm-hmm. uh, but not, not necessarily, uh, Dan Quinn. And, and, and if that didn't necessarily keep up, like they didn't necessarily continue to, to kind of play that sort of coverage. But I think the point was that the, it, it, it's not, a static situation. It's not, you know, Hey, we're running cover three and you're not going to beat us at it, which has been, you know, the, the, I think the problematic aspect of cover three more than anything is that, you know, an unwillingness to disguise what you're doing, uh, uh, just, you know, basically rolling your, your safeties down and saying, Hey, Hey, we're playing cover three. You ready? Uh, you know, so I think that those changes in Quinn's philosophy, you know, look, we got fooled by McCarthy to a large degree of the whole the whole PFF visit and <laughs> analytics and all that. So I, I know what it's like to to try to sell yourself uh, as a changed coach and uh, and then to kind of have you know at least lackluster results and and how much you may have changed. But to me, Quinn is is doesn't really fall into that category. It honestly feels uh, like a different defense than the one I I would see playing in, in Atlanta and certainly the one I'd see playing uh, in Seattle when he was a coach. Yeah, I'm taking a look at the coverage breakdowns provided to me via True Media, which is like a new tool that The Athletic uh, has allowed me to play with. And it looks like, obviously, there's a lot of cover one, but a a bunch of defenses these days have a lot of cover one. Um, But relative to the rest of the league, it looks like, if I've got, what is it, the Cowboys are in the second column here. Um, It looks like uh, they've got probably the third or fourth most cover one in the league. Um, They've got actually bottom half cover three percentage they've got a kind of average amount of cover two um and they play a tiny amount of cover six like you said we see a little bit of quarters not too much we see a little bit of two man uh, more than more than much of the league in two man and a, a decent but below average amount of of cover zero so there's a there's a huge mix here in terms of yeah. what they do what is it about that secondary group, which obviously that includes Trayvon Diggs, but but also has Anthony Brown. <laughs> um, <laughs> Though, what, listen, we, we can look. We no more, and maybe maybe that changes this week after you guys destroy us uh, in the passing game. But <laughs> I, I think you know the time for for uh, uh, destroying Anthony Brown. May, maybe behind us at least temporary. He's played pretty good football this year. It, it, the week one and two stuff was like, yeah, I get, I yeah. get it. Yeah, I mean, look, and maybe it's comparison, and maybe it's like you know what versus what we expect. But I, I feel like he's played better coverage than I uh, certainly what we expected. And you know, there was a desperation to get Kelvin Joseph ready uh, to be the uh, opposite corner uh, uh, from from Diggs early on, and and when you know the injury happened, and it, it became clear that it wasn't going to happen. Uh, you know, there's a lot of panic on Cowboys nation that Anthony Brown was going to be the starter op- opposite of, of uh, Diggs, And, and I, I just don't know that it's been as warranted. I think he's played pretty good football. I mean, he himself already has two picks and a pick six, you know? So it, it's not like he uh, uh, has been just the other guy out there either. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, I think that that's him playing better football than he did last year. And, and to be fair to him, he was, he, he played with broken ribs all of last season. So that's that's tough, but I, I think him playing better football, and then really the biggest difference has been the the change of personnel at the safety position. The Cowboys turned over the safety position this year in a way that, I mean, first of all, they've never been able to do. They've always had problems with getting safeties. They've they've rarely haven't had a great safety in a really long time, uh, and suddenly they signed three guys. 
uh, in the, in the off season. Uh, yeah, let's, and let's, hoping- let's talk about J Ron curse. Let's talk about, Oh, absolutely. Oh, and, and, yeah. I mean, and, 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 and cause, cause they signed three guys hoping they'd hit on one. And I think, you know, in some ways they've hit on all three. I, I, they're, they're all three playing good football, good enough that they're, they're all three playing regularly, but obviously, especially curse who, uh, you know, obviously you have tons of experience. And I'm, I'm interested to hear your experience on a curse a little bit because, uh, we, you know, I went back and watched tape when we signed him. And you know, going back and watching his tape at Detroit, it it looked like something had had clicked with him by the end of the year. Uh, and I was interested to see exactly what kind of defensive player he would end up being, maybe as a kind of a rotational guy or you know, third safety, a nickel linebacker type, because they had kind of used him all over it and not necessarily to his strength <laughs> until the end. You know, typical Lions coaching, right? But <laughs> but. I was shocked when we got what we got out of Curse. I mean, he's been an absolute playmaker. Uh, he's a tone setter for this defense. He's a leader on this defense. Um, you know, it, it's it's just absolutely been a, a, an eye opening experience. His time in Minnesota was interesting. I'll say that uh, most of the time on the field it was actually fairly positive. Had a bunch of huge errors that were fairly obvious. Uh, there were issues at Clemson where people called him soft. He did not take to that very well, but there were moments on the field in Minnesota where that kind of came out. Does not seem like that's the case with the Cowboys. Um, no, but, yeah. Soft is not what I would call uh, yeah. his, his game with the Cowboys, at least. Uh, yeah. So far. Um, and it, it was, it was just like very weird. His tackling angles were bad. He's like a six, five safety. You can't really have bad tackling angles. If you're a six, five safety. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. He was, he was, he was a pretty unusual guy because his splashy plays were really good. Um, and then he would also make these just these catastrophic errors. Um, so I guess, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, Hey man, if you iron those out, you'll be really good. But I could say that about like 80% of the players in the league. So I don't know how much that's (laughs) worth. Um, so, so he he was kind of a difficult guy to figure out. And then he ended up being on the outs with Zimmer for more attitudinal reasons than on field reasons. Um, decided he didn't want to play in Minnesota anymore. I don't think Minnesota was all that excited about that prospect either, so he was able to kind of seek his fortunes elsewhere. I don't think he got what he wanted out of Detroit. It seems like he's getting what he wants out of Dallas. But you mentioned that there were other people that they signed, right? And I think, um, tell me if I'm wrong, it feels like anything to get Donovan Wilson out of the paint. That's what it felt like. Um, but you you have, you added Malik Hooker, you've got DeMonte KZ, who is or isn't at fault for that kind of last-minute touchdown. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was casey for sure <laughs> as we all nice. know co- coverage yeah. is is a binary outcome only one person can be at fault that's right, that's right. <laughs> there's always some there's always someone to blame and you can either be right or wrong about who you blame for sure right <laughs> so um what what is that what is the rest of that safety so you mentioned that the other two have all kind of looked like they've hit um is donovan wilson out of the paint is that a good thing you know, here, the thing with Donovan Wilson was is that he was the guy that hit last year. You know, he had an incredible year last year and, and, and was creating a bunch of turnovers and was a player that the Cowboys, at least fandom, was extremely excited about. Um, and then when training camp rolled around, you know, I mean, we, we do a lot of tea leaving, uh, tea leave reading in, in this job, and you just weren't hearing anything about Donovan Wilson. Uh, you know, not from the coaches, not from the people that whisper inside the buildings. Um, and, you know, w- come to find out that, you know, he had uh, trained away from the facility uh, and and he may have fallen out of favor a little bit with the coaching staff. Uh, and, and that kind of played out a little bit in training camp because, again, like after the year he had had and after the history, the last decades worth of history for the Cowboys and safeties, you fully expected Donovan Wilson to at least be the starter, you know, at, at safety because the mm-hmm. Cowboys didn't have a lot of great options. Uh, enter K- KZ, enter Curse, enter Hooker. Um, and, you know, suddenly Wilson, who started this, the started training camp uh, kind of on, uh, I think he's on started on pup because of a, of a groin that he later re aggravated. Um, you know, it, it 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 allowed a lot of opportunity for other folks to to uh, to rotate in. Now, you know, he and then he got hurt again, and so and he's just now making his way back. In fact, the New England game was the was his first game back, uh, and he should be playing uh, more in this game. But I, I I say that, but I don't really know what his role is now because 
I think, you know, ultimately a lot of us loved him as a third safety because I, I think that's the amount of snaps that you're going to get the best of Donovan Wilson without uh, it, it really the way you described curse, you know, his, his time in Minnesota was kind of uh, what we got out of Donovan Wilson, just a very boom and bust player. Like he's either making the play or he's the guy who screwed up the the assignment and the play was made on him, you know? So I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see exactly how he gets deployed here uh, moving forward. I do imagine that they'll try to play him more um, in at the free safety because just it, it feels like when he's down in the box, he can just get washed out too much unless he's actually down there with a specific job to do, i.e. blitzing or covering a guy out of the slot. If he's, Is, if isn't he's that down, just Xavier Woods? Yeah. Oh, gee, oh. We can have a conversation. Let's, let's he's good now. To this around about he's good now. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. I've said that before. So, uh, uh, <laughs> oh my god, how many times have I said Xavier Woods is good now? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, and I think ultimately at the end of the day, um, he has really good instincts for the ball. I'll talk about Wilson again. He has really good instincts for the ball, but I think sometimes uh, he gets fooled by his eyes. And and I think that's why he struggles to be down in the box because, it, you know, it just happens so fast. Mm-hmm. I think he sees it a lot better when he's in the back. All right. Um, Trayvon Diggs, a lot of yards given up, a lot of picks added in. PFF, the nature of their grading prevents them from being able to grade him too highly because you can only max out on a particular grade of plus 2.0. Um, so his his PFF grade is not that great. Yeah. But I, I believe he leads the league in EPA in coverage as the clo- as the nearest defender, which of By course... By a lot, too, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's it's shocking how the, the, the distance between him and number two. Near, nearest defender tracking also assigns DeMonte Casey that touchdown. That's all I'm going to add on there. <laughs> um, so... I, the chips have 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 their quirks, right? But it seems like it's been worth it. But turnovers are like like he's not going to keep up this insane streak that he has. Turnovers are fairly volatile. Yards given up are not fairly volatile. Will it continue to be worth it? That's a very good question, you know, and I and I think you know if, if you're a, a realistic Cowboys fan, it's a question you need to ask yourself uh, about this. this so defense zero Cowboys fans will be asking themselves. Yeah, I know, and, and <laughs> that's why I said I, I you know, preface it with re- realistic Cowboys fans, which is a uh, you know a, de- a dying if not dead breed. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I I think that turnovers will always be a big part of Diggs' game because I think he does have a uh, preternatural ab- ability to, to, to not only get towards the ball, but to finish the play. Because I think that's the difference, right? Is that, you know, there's a lot of guys who are as good, uh, better than him at, you know, studying tape, understanding passing concepts, understanding formations, and then, you know, seeing the formation, realizing who the team is, knowing their tendencies, and being able to break because, okay, they only run this uh, this bunch formation with the wide receiver alone on the, on the weak side when they're running a slant to him. So I know that this guy's running a slant. And, and I, there's lots of guys who, could, who have that kind of knowledge, who study tape, who understand it, who could see it in, in that kind of real-time speed and, and react to it. I think the difference between him and, and a lot of other people is that he has that, and then he also has an incredible ability to catch the football, uh, a wide receiver ability to catch the football. And I think you know people have been talking all week, like, what's your favorite interception of his? <laughs> I think the last one he did was unbelievable uh, against New England, and, and it wasn't like it was you know he broke on the ball and picked it off, and and that's what you know. Because uh, th- those are the interceptions that always make people's eye, you know, eyes saucer, right? Is that, you know, mm-hmm. oh, what a great break on the ball. He's got it. What a great read. This was a situation where it was just deflected off the receiver, but he was able to catch the ball off a deflection while midair stepping over another player and bring the ball in quick enough to secure it to run it back for a touchdown. And I think that that... You know, having that kind of hand-eye coordination and and ability to put yourself near the ball, I, I think he will be a guy that gets 
a lot of turnovers in his career. However, <laughs> oh I agree. There is yeah. a, a one for one ratio of games to interceptions is probably, and actually he's higher than that. If we're, that's we're right. Just yeah. this year. Yeah. I, I don't think that's a realistic uh, pace to keep up. Uh, so I do think that he needs to get better uh, as a sticky cover guy. Uh, but I also wonder how much of the yardage that he's given up is due to the fact that there's times when he's baiting guys and mm-hmm. then he just didn't make the play on it, you know? So I, it's I kind think of interesting. Will- I know, I know Richard Sherman uh, back when he was in elite corner would talk about how good corners actually do get the ball thrown to them because they're baiting guys. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and he would continue to, to bait quarterbacks to throw to him and he would get picks, but he didn't give up nearly as many yards. Sure. And Diggs and Diggs talks about that too. Um, and I, I think that, you know, it's it's one of those situations where it hasn't come back to bite the Cowboys yet. Uh, but it, it certainly could. I mean, because he's, you know, he is uh he's considered to be the best corner on this team. I mean, he is the best corner on this team. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Which is the debate, I, I mean, yeah. But he's, I mean, but I he's like not. Jordan Lewis, but like, <laughs> let's be real. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I mean, you liking Jordan Lewis is better than most of the Cowboys fans, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think, you know, for Diggs, he's clearly the best corner on the team. Uh, but the question is, is, you know, what, what do you want your best corner to be? Because he is kind of the opposite of what we had with Byron Jones, right? We, you know, with Byron Jones, they, no one just, no one threw at him. But he also never got any interceptions ever while he was there, basically. I mean, I think he got one while he was here. So you know, the Cowboys didn't necessarily want to pay for that. I think for the Cowboys and their team... What, what um, if they could have just had both? I mean, I understand that the cap exists, but like, it, it would have been nice to have, instead of Anthony Brown, Byron Jones and Trayvon Diggs, and then Diggs gets all the targets. Like, I, That feels good. Uh, you know, look, if, if hindsight is... 2020 i'm sure they they, they may have gone it's back not to that, that they didn't know byron jones was good though like that uh, uh, hindsight's no, 2020 you're, you're, you're certainly foreseen? right there but at the same time like i don't i think i think they honestly are i think that there's something to the way that the cowboys want to win football games that they want they would rather have volatility on defense that is creating turnover than uh uh you know just very vanilla unable to make a play when they need to because ultimately it was the same even with byron jones on the team playing as well as he he was it wasn't like it prevented anybody from moving the football on the cowboys you mm-hmm. know what i'm saying at least at least now they're getting turnovers they're they're, they're getting the ball back and they have a, an offense that they believe and we believe is a juggernaut so if you can get the ball back a couple of different times and 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 although i don't necessarily believe that Diggs will continue the pace of interceptions I do kind of believe that the Cowboys can at least keep up a level of of turnovers, uh, you know, week to week. Uh, may, hopefully, one or two a week. Uh, uh, maybe I mean I don't know if that's completely unrealistic, but I, I think that the Cowboys lead the league in turnovers per drive on defense. That's not that's not going to maintain itself. <laughs> No, probably not. But I think I think you know keeping a high level of of turnover in considering where the Cowboys have been in the past, you know, let's say four or five years, like mm-hmm. keeping a higher level of turnovers will do wonders for giving this offense, which is how they want to win, more opportunities and more chances to win these games. Sure. Uh, they they just you know clearly are not interested in being a a, a defense that is the shut, a shutdown defense. They want a defense that's getting the ball back to their offense. All right, so real quick question before I've got I've got this question, I've got a question about linebackers, and then we'll go back to the defensive line. Um, so we saw Deion Sanders take snaps at receiver. We saw Patrick Peterson take snaps <laughs> at receiver. Now, the difference, of course, is that the Cowboys have a lot of good receivers, but will we see Trayvon Diggs, who did play receiver at Alabama, take snaps at receiver? Uh, I don't it know. It doesn't have to be you this know, year. I just yeah, mean, like, I'm, for the Cowboys. I, I think maybe, honestly. I mean, look, <laughs> as soon as Connor McGovern catches the pass, Tra- Trayvon Diggs is walking <laughs> right over table. to Dylan Moore yeah. and be like, man, look, man, come on. <laughs> you know? So, I, I yeah, as soon, if they're giving Connor McGovern the ball, I have a feeling Diggs is going to uh, throw his hands up pretty, pretty. Well, well, Diggs's are known to demand the ball. Uh, That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, real quick on linebackers, would you rather have a Leighton Vanderesh's rookie year or the current trajectory of Michael Parsons' rookie year? 
uh, the current trajectory of Micah Parsons, I think. Because I, I, I think what you could do with Micah Parsons um, is unique. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that I can go find very good linebackers to fill in on the back end there. Um, and I ask them I, to do linebacker things. And ask them to do yeah. linebacker things, yeah. And, and, and I, I, Parsons is a kid that, you know, his skill set is so rare. Um, I, I don't, you know, look, I don't know if you know John Owning or, or, or what he does with, uh, he works with PFF, but he's. He was he actually my first, you were, you were my second choice for this podcast. He was my oh, first wow. Choice. Yeah. Wow. Well, th- there so, we go. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I take no cards offense on the table. That, no offense <laughs> to that because you know, former podcast partner. I mean, we're really good friends. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, Parsons is a guy that, you know, a lot of people were skeptical as a pass rusher and, and John was one of them. And I think, you know, once he got in there and you actually saw what for, he could For context, do, John Owning's specialty is talking about pass rushers. So that yes, absolutely. He's like yeah, very sorry. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very, very well, very knowledgeable on, on everything from, uh, you know, stringing moves together all the different types of moves yeah he, the, he likes the amount of the amount of things rushers. i've plagiarized from him when talking <laughs> about pass rushers wow oh yeah absolutely oh <laughs> uh, yeah constantly got to steal from john because yeah. you got to steal from the best right yeah um uh, yeah it, it, the he parsons made a believer out of him you know and and, and i think because you, you just were like look this guy's he's undersized like he's you know it takes a crazy special athlete to be to to, to do what you, you guys think that parsons can do and then we watched a couple of snaps. You're like, oh, oh, yeah, he is that crazy special athlete. Oh, never mind. Okay, cool. We're good with that. Let him go. Uh, you know, that's basically where we're at. You know, is that he's he suddenly is able, despite not having done it in college, to go out and beat NFL left tackles with with you know quality sacks, pass rush moves, not just like speed around the edge. Right. Um. And and you know that's incredible, an incredible tool to have, and, and especially in a defense like we mentioned that is truly trying to be kind of matchup based and, and truly trying to uh, find ways to attack uh, uh, an offense game plan by game plan. All right. Uh, let's talk real quick about the defensive line. So you've got the better Odigizua. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really uh, almost by default, I, right? Because yeah. like, <laughs> it, it, it felt like, Oh, uh, like just, you know, he, he couldn't stay on the field. I loved him coming out. Of I really play. liked him coming out. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and I I just but I knew that he was kind of stiff hipped and and yeah. and then yep. the injury problems happened and yeah. Uh, and you didn't but, know if he could play DT or or edge or whatever. It yeah, was. yeah, that was there yeah. was some position flex stuff with with him. I but I'll tell you this, I, I've I personally. And I'll, John will John will tell you this. I personally have been a huge Oso Digizua fan for a while. Uh, I just think that his combination of background. I love, I love wrestlers who are in the trenches. Uh, it, it's just such a clean trans uh, translation. You know, it's so. That's a, that's a very Vikings take, by the way. They draft is an inordinate amount of wrestlers. Yeah. Well, is it wasn't? Uh, oh man, now I'm I'm really gonna feel bad. Who's that really all time great defensive tackle? Uh, uh, John Randall wasn't John Randall a wrestler in college? Probably. Yeah, I I, I think you know there's just something that about, really fits, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just like uh, those guys who are kind of undersized a little bit, but incredibly strong, understand leverage, right? Like that's the yes, thing about the uh, wrestling when you understand how to contort your body to get as low as possible while maintaining the the most amount of power that's incredibly difficult to deal with and when you're explosive and you and you're playing that low uh you know it, it can allow for even some mistakes with your hand usage because you're just so disruptive and you're just getting in there and, and whether it's run blocking or pass blocking you're muddying the water so bad uh that i think it's it, it's it's incredibly disruptive and it's incredibly useful for a defensive line that, I mean, you know, you want to talk another position, right? Defensive tackle and safety were the two positions that all Cowboys fans were just like, what are we going to do? And, you know, we drafted Odigizua, we brought in some other guys, but no one expected, maybe except for me, Odigizua to actually do anything this year. Uh, and then, and then even worse, you know, we lost our guy that was supposed to be our starting uh, uh, under tackle in Neville Gallimore, uh, who should be coming back in the next few weeks. But obviously, Odigizua came in and played about as well as you can expect for a rookie defensive tackle third round pick. Um, and and now they're kind of cr- using him in all sorts of ways. I mean, I've seen him in formations where 
they line up him as the defensive end. And then inside, they've got Randy Gregory, Micah Parsons, and uh, Terrell Basham all like as interior pass rushers. And then they just run crazy stunts off of that and just looping guys around and getting them free. Um, and that's really been the way that the Cowboys have been kind of creating pressure is they don't necessarily have, they certainly don't have what the Vikings have as far as talent on the defensive line necessarily. I mean, there are some guys like Gregory is certainly a guy and, and, and Parsons is certainly a guy, but I think that the reason that they've had any success uh, outside of, you know, Gre- Gregory's uh, high quality sacks is they've, they've been really good about, you know, sending Parsons up the middle, you know, as a, as a, as a you know, as a guy that's uh, you know, basically essentially opening things up for Odigi Zua, who's looping around uh, as a spike, is what I was trying to say, mm-hmm. uh, and then opening things up for the defensive tackles, kind of loop around and get free, and really that's been the best way the Cowboys have found to you know consistently get pressure on on third downs when they put their offense uh, you know in in those kind of third and long situations. So do do you trust the Cowboys to consistently get pressure on third down then? <sighs> No, I mean, I, I'm still, yeah, I, look, I, I'm still very much, uh, um, uh, you know, scarred from, from the last few years. Um, look, I, I'm starting to trust it more. I, I think if you're getting into a third and long situation, I, I do believe the Cowboys can get you off the field this year in a way that they haven't been able to in the past. It, it's not like it was in the Buccaneers game where literally every single time a third down didn't get converted – Cowboys Nation was like, what just happened? What happens when they don't get the third down? What happens on fourth down? We've never been here before. You know, it's like it's it, they just didn't understand what a punt to us was uh, <laughs> after after the 2020 season. Uh, and, and, and we now at least have a level of expectation that the Cowboys, if they get into those third and longs, they can get off the field. But I don't know that I'm ever going to, or at least not currently, you know, truly in my heart, believe it. Oh, it's third and long. The Cowboys getting off the field. I just, they just have not had that kind of defense in a long time. All right. General question is the best athlete on the team. Siwo Olanula. Oh man. Uh, say is a, is an incredible athlete. Um, in the, in, in I'll tell you what I I I don't, I don't know if you're if if this is something that you studied my my uh, timeline which I'm assuming you have not and, and you're and not everyone's watching me like my paranoid self thinks <laughs> uh, but I'm a huge Sao fan and and I, I, I I'm also the fullback guy in Cowboys Twitter like anytime <laughs> anytime a fullback because I, I played fullback in high school so I, anytime oh, a fullback perfect. does it, right. does anything. I always, everyone's like, oh, McCool uh, BCB is really enjoying himself right now. Uh, so, you know, when I watch in training camp, Seo Alona Lua running a wheel route free up the sideline and getting a 50 yard touchdown against the Rams' number one defense, I'm losing my mind, you know? Uh, and, and, and when he got hurt, it was, it was, it was very, very unfortunate. And I was very upset because I really thought he was going to open it up. But uh, to answer your, that was a very long winded way of saying, uh, I I think he certainly is in the conversation. I think Parsons is certainly in that conversation as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's he's he's. Uh, you don't see many people built like him that move like him. That's for sure. All right. So you the answer to this next question cannot be Demarcus Lawrence or Michael Gallup. Okay. If you could take someone out of injury or out of the reserve, right, uh, and and make them potentially active, who would it be? Hmm. Well, ter- currently Neville Gallimore is in in the injured reserve, right. so, so I would so he's the it would be him. Yeah, okay. because honestly, you know, we watched a lot of what we, he was doing in training camp, uh, and and he was the guy we were excited about at defensive tackle for this season. Uh, more, I mean, Odigi Zua was was obviously showing things well beyond what you thought a rookie could do, but Gallimore was the guy that you thought, okay, this guy can actually be something as a defensive tackle this year. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, hurt his shoulder, and, and that kind of has derailed things a little bit. But he's he was the guy I would definitely choose, just because I feel like if the Cowboys were able to kind of cons- start to consistently get pass rush from the middle of their defense, uh, I, I feel like this defense would go up a notch because uh, that's really something that they're missing here. They kind of have to manufacture they have that. Missing. Yeah, yeah, they, they kind of have to manufacture it a lot, and they do that with Parsons. Sometimes they do that with like like I said, kind of a, a unique. Uh, uh, alignments 
uh, and then, you know, stunts and that sort of thing. But if they were able to just kind of line up and have two guys in the middle who could rush the passer, uh, that would be something that would take this defense from, you know, hovering below average to an average to maybe even above average. Uh, next question. When will the Cowboys allow the next Tony Romo, which of course is Ben DiNucci, a real <laughs> shot at proving himself? Oh, oh! I, I think Ben DiNucci's been given his shot. I, I, well, I don't you know, gotta dude. let him develop. He was a rookie. Come on. Uh, uh, yeah. Look, I mean, uh, let's let's be honest. Mike Mike McCarthy's not gonna let him fail. <laughs> like he's like McCarthy. <laughs> like, I don't know if you know the history here, but he's like McCarthy's brother-in-law's like he coached him in basketball in Pittsburgh or something like there's like a there's like a, a nepotism thing here somewhere Dope. so so, so uh if you're if you're a, a Danucci fan uh, which I yes, am I, I bought there's a there's a shirt that is him in a Dallas Cowboys uniform that just says goat I bought yeah. that shirt <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm if, taking I'm wearing it to a James Madison homecoming game in the in wow. the coming weeks that's yeah. exciting. We're That's all exciting. in on on Ben Danucci on this podcast. Um, uh, you, you're not a real Danucci fan unless you hold your uh, pointer finger and your thumb together uh, on both hands while you're saying his name, Danucci. You <laughs> Danucci. know, uh, uh, <laughs> my uh, my wife always uh, my wife's Italian, and, and every time she hears that name, she she always comes in with a very over the top uh, perfect uh, you know, Italian. Perfect. Uh, but yeah, I, I think. He is a guy that is going to get lots of opportunity because of that, and say I'm what glad. you will about That's it. Good. I, I, I so, so so will he overtake Dak in twenty twenty three? Then you think? I mean that. I mean that's you really think it's going to take that long? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I the thinking, contract. That's that's what worries me is the contract. Look, you know, I mean, he's got a hurt calf right now. So maybe they just get yeah. a couple of Danucci synapses in there with one. You're like, you know what? This guy. Is yeah. Bad. I mean, honestly, we should, he should be on, on activation watch, right? Because they can activate <laughs> people on game day. Um, I mean, you he's just so don't want bad. to throw a Cooper he's so Rush bad. at him. <laughs> he's so bad. He's, I can't do it anymore. He's so bad. Like, I mean, honestly, if if we could just get him to consist, like, you know, th- there's always talk about, oh, this guy can throw from different platforms, and he's got all these different arm angles. And, oh, and, and Ben DiNucci has like, one arm angle, Josh, and it is Josh, insane. Danucci, throw it over the top. <laughs> throw it over the top of your shoulder so you don't get the ball knocked down at the line of scrimmage. It's It's... It's infuriating, honestly, to watch. He's six three and he throws like he's five eight. I love it. Uh, It's amazing. It's it's Vince Young. Like Vince Young had the same thing, right? Like where it was like, oh, you got the six four quarterback who's you know, but it's not useful to be six four if you throw it at the same height as someone who's five eleven. You know, like it's it's just that's that doesn't you don't need to include his height anymore at this point. Yeah, it's. You know, I I think he has some athleticism to him. I, I think he does have some arm strength to him i just have i haven't seen very much development and that's what you clearly need oh, to see so, so they should they should treat him like Taysom hill for a while then is what you're saying oh definitely uh, design some packages you know yeah, for him for yeah because sure. i'm sure uh yeah the cowboys fandom would definitely uh well i mean you you gotta put definitely the ball. accept that as, just as well as the saints fans have right right yeah you gotta take the ball out of the hands of ezekiel elliott and dak prescott and put it in ben DiNucci's hands that's <laughs> For sure, what you, you need can to be give doing. Danucci the ball in space. You absolutely <laughs> have to do it. You've got to do it, guys. <laughs> All right. All right. So he is on activation watch. We'll 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 keep you updated here on the Norse Good yeah, Podcast. Long term deep dynasty sleeper guy. Yeah, Definitely no, for sure. For sure. I do have him, I think, on one of my dynasty rosters. It's a great <laughs> you, bit. You really, oh. really I mean, did you coach his 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 uh, <laughs> brother in law in basketball? <laughs> What's your excuse? I'm a duke for life. That's what my uh, excuse is. All duke right. For life. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Game oh. predictions. Um we, he's not the only James Madison guy on the roster, right? There was another one. Uh no, Rondell Carter's no longer on the Ron- roster. Yeah, Rondell Carter uh, who I really liked a lot uh decided he didn't want to be on the Cowboys practice squad. Um and I get it cuz honestly Fair I enough. think yeah, he's he he actually could uh, I don't know where he is right now, but he could be on an active roster, I think. I think um, I think he's on a different practice squad right now. Yeah, I uh, think you're right, but I, I really like him. And I, oh, I we might see him tonight. 
You no, probably no, won't. you may actually, <laughs> especially if JJ Watts hurt. Maybe they, maybe they'll call him. Up. Was, hey, yeah, there you go. Finally, we get some. You're gonna get, get Wally pipped field. by, uh, by <laughs> another great <laughs> <master> guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's you heard it here first folks um th- this is getting published after that game so we'll see what happens oh good good, good. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh real quick uh game prediction i think the cowboys they opened at two and a half point favorites they are now one point favorites i think that's entirely because of the dak prescott stuff um game prediction go i'm actually worried about this game for the cowboys i mean i, I think you know the vikings present uh a, a balanced offense Um, and I think, you know, the Cowboys, they can win a whole bunch of ways. Their offense can score almost any way you can conceive. They can take advantage of whatever defense they face. I really do believe that. I think the the problem they're going to run into is when they face a team that may stymie them early on and, and that allows the opposing team's offense to remain balanced. And that's where the Cowboys defense will rear its ugly head, right? Uh, Because if the Cowboys can't force the uh, uh, other team to get into a passing situation early and play with the lead, uh, then it, they let teams linger and they'll let a team linger all the way into the fourth quarter. Uh, And, you know, when it gets to the fourth quarter, it can be anyone's game. The Cowboys are lucky because Dak Prescott is one of the best fourth quarter and and overtime quarterbacks apparently of all time. I, after looking at some of the numbers, it's, it's well, actually, but the numbers it, also tell us that Tony Romo was fantastic in the fourth quarter too. Well, he was fantastic in the fourth quarter, just maybe not in the just not what it mattered. Yeah, no, no, no for sure, for sure. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I think if the if if Dallas doesn't take care of business early and they let uh, the Vikings kind of hang around then I, I think it could be a coin flip at the end of the game. Um, but I, I do Great. expect another the coin Cow- flip game for the Vikings. They've only had <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, well, I mean, well, it's, it's all you guys know, right? All you guys know is, I mean, is, is playing coin flip games and all we know is playing down to our competition. So I don't see how this isn't <laughs> going to be a coin flip game, honestly. So um, I, yeah, I think the Cowboys are going to try to uh, to make this game one dimensional the best they can, whether that's through scoring points or just focusing on trying to stop the run and make Kirk Cousins beat them. And if it becomes a game where it's hurt Dak Prescott versus Kirk Cousins, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, no offense, I'm probably still picking the Cowboys, I think. No, I get it. I get it. Uh, if it's down to Greg Zerline making the game winning kick, are you confident? I'm, I'm probably not conscious. Uh, I, I probably blacked out as, as he lined up to try to make the kick. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not confident. I mean, I, I think I'm certainly not as confident as Bones Fossil is in in in, uh, in, in Zerline. So, all time uh, great special teams coach. You put some respect on that name. I listen. <laughs> I, I I like Bones Fossil way more than most folks do. Uh, I just don't love his confidence in Greg Zerline. All right, so we got two shaky Gregs kicking for the teams on Sunday night. <laughs> this is going to be fantastic. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, so if people want to find your takes, they can follow you on Twitter. Was it at McCoolBCB? That's it. What kind of name is McCool? Like, that's it, is that a natural, is that an Ellis Island name? Is that, what, what what's yeah, going on it, here? It, it's an Ellis Island name. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the original name was McGool, and, uh, and they butchered it in the most awesome way. Yeah, that's incredible. Wow. That, yeah. that 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 was a long play by like your great grandfather for that to yeah, come into the yeah. slam. He played it right. And, and, uh, <laughs> and we're we're all now all his great great grandchildren every once in a while have to, you know, occasionally hear from strangers. McCool, what a what a cool name. And I'm like, oh thanks. <laughs> thanks. All right, all right, all right. Um yeah, so at McCool BCB spelled how it sounds. Um and they can uh, they can see your or they can hear your takes. Uh, Locked on Cowboys is that right? Anything else? To That's right. Yeah, Locked on Cowboys podcast with me and Marcus Mosier. Uh, if you if you want to, you can ignore Marcus and just listen to me. No, for um, sure. And and that's that's totally cool too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, man. Thank you so much. All right. Let's go to the mailbag. And the first question is from Kyle Slaby, who asks: Was the Weatherly trade more made more as a result of Everson's play or Weatherly's? <laughs> A uh, little bit of both. Obviously, they wouldn't have done it if Everson Griffin wasn't playing at a really high level. Um, but I think that part of it also was the fact that Weatherly was responsible for the blocked punt. Um, you know, he should have been the one blocking the the crossing blitzer uh, on that punt protection. Uh, it was sort of referenced in a presser today with the special teams coordinator. We asked, you know, hey, 
what can you do to prevent, you know, stuff like that in the future? And, you know, he basically said, well, it wasn't as if, you know, they found a hole in our protection or anything like that. The protection was fine. It was down to the execution of a single individual. And that person was Stephen Weather, who's no longer with the team. So I think that plays a role <laughs> for sure. Um, but also, uh, you know, the fact that he wasn't playing well on defense when he was on defense, I think that's all of those are, are big contributors. But I think that if he hadn't done that on the on the blocked punt, he'd still be on the team. If he, if he was playing better on defense, he'd still be on the team. If Everson Griffin was playing worse, uh, Weatherly would still be on the team. So I think it's a combination of all three factors. Also from Kyle Slaby, is the head coach of the 2022 Minnesota Vikings going to be coaching Sunday night for either team? <laughs> um, I think there is a non-zero chance that Kellen Moore will be in the coaching cycle, the head coaching cycle next year. I think there's a non-zero chance that the Vikings will be also looking for a new head coach within the next year. Um, I think that it would not surprise me if ownership decided to go in the opposite direction and hire an offensive head coach as opposed to a defensive head coach in the next coaching cycle should they be looking for one um so all of these do kind of fit together uh kellen moore from my understanding is also like analytically minded and that's something that the ownership seems to value uh and uh is you know he's running a really good offense so it's entirely possible for sure so it's gonna say if he was trying to imply that Mike McCarthy was gonna end up coaching the Vikings, I no, absolutely not. We, we might have to exercise that block button here. But that would be funny, but no, absolutely. Not. <laughs> like for content purposes, maybe. <laughs> yeah. For watchability, no. Uh, Jeremy McGee asks: With a non-turnstile option at left tackle, do we expect a change in play calling? Will younger Kubiak potentially call longer developing plays and take more deep shots if Darisaw continues to play well? Yeah, I think so. I think it's entirely within the realm of possibility that um, when when they become more comfortable with the way the offensive line is protecting, and a big part of that is Derisaw's play, that they will call longer developing plays. I think uh, this was something that was brought up um, in a, one of my pieces a little bit ago, that it, the way that Derisaw is going to be influencing play calling, or I may have even said this on the last podcast, the way that Derisaw is going to be influencing play calling is not, um, or the offense is not necessarily a reduced pressure rate, although he might do that, or rather an increased affordance for what the Vikings can do. And so he might be asked to do more as the season goes on um, and therefore give up the same or an even worse pressure rate. But because the likelihood of getting pressure late in the play is now lower, the Vikings are much more likely to demand more of him, call deeper dropbacks, call uh, slower plays, and be able to develop a more explosive offense. So I think that's going to be the ultimate effect of having um, you know two tackles that you know that you trust. So... Yeah, uh, I, I think that that's certainly on the table for sure. Next question is going to be from Jack Rackham, who asks, when facing a team like Dallas or the Vikings that has a dynamic ability through the air and on the ground, do teams try to stop both attacks or do they generally pick one or the other to shut down and hope for the best against whatever they don't choose? Uh, I mean, like from a very simpleton perspective, yeah, they try to stop both attacks. But from the spirit of your question perspective, uh, my understanding is that teams actually do try to pick one um, in hopes that it'll kind of defang the other uh, and and that they'll kind of just, you know, ride up their hopes for the other one. Um, so if the Vikings kind of determine like, hey, they've got a really good passing game, but a lot of that passing game is like dependent on, you know, this element of play action or protection capability that Ezekiel Elliott, Elliott provides or, you know, a lot of it's occurring on third down um, or on ambiguous downs where they could either run or pass. We're going to try to stop the run to put them in pass-only situations, it's going to be better for us, right? Um, or we're going to limit their playbook in some way. Um, or, you know, Belichick very often does this, uh, invites running the running game in order to, to stop the passing game, and we'll just take less efficient runs. So, um, yeah, teams will very often pick their poison uh, based on kind of their understanding of what kind of wins in football, what will work based off of the qualities of both teams in particular, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I don't think that they try to kind of evenly devote resources across both. I think that they try to pick a strength and 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 get rid of that and and make it in offense one dimensional. Next question is from John Belk, who asks if the Dolphins actually trade for Watson. Pause for vomiting. Should the Vikings try to trade for Tua as a QB of the future fly, uh, flyer? If so, how much would you be willing to give up? Uh, my guess is not enough that the Dolphins would be willing to trade Tua in that scenario, right? Like, the 49ers 
just drafted a quarterback, right? Like a top five quarterback. He's going to be the quarterback of the future. It doesn't matter that he's actually a safety. You know, they've, they've invested a lot of talent in the position and they still don't want to trade Jimmy Garoppolo away. Uh, Seth Wickersham recently reported in his book that there were some informal conversations between the Patriots and the 49ers with the Patriots. We're trying to kind of feel out what the price might be for Garoppolo. You know, it's not necessarily that they were actively involved in trade talks or anything like that, but they were like, you know, what if it was like a second round pick and the 49ers were very firm in that it would be a first round pick. Um, in some of the same way, I would imagine that the Dolphins would try to hold out and uh, make that a first round pick cost. And I would not trade a first round pick for Tua Tagovailoa in a world where the team that drafted him gave up on him. Um, so uh, I, I would certainly explore that opportunity, right? I, 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 I would love to see kind of what a competition between Kellen Mond next year and Tua Tagovailoa next year looks like. Um, I don't think either of them are the community of the future, but I think that having those flyers, the having those dart throws uh, in your quiver or whatever, t- terrible mixing of analogies, Jesus. Um, I think that's a good thing to do. So um, I would I would look into it. Uh, the most I'd give up, I, I think that I would give up a second round pick for sure. Um, I think that Tua is not yet a franchise quarterback, but I think he's probably one of the top 32 quarterbacks uh, in the world right now. Um, so I think that's worth at least a second round pick. So I, I would, I would probably throw that in. I would not trade a first though. I think that that's a little bit too much. So that's kind of where I would be. And I, I just don't think that the dolphins would, um, would be in the same spot. Uh, Jacob Wander asks for the mailbag on a scale of one to butt fumble. How funny is it that Marcus Williams didn't learn his lesson from the Minneapolis miracle and did the exact same thing on DK Metcalf's touchdown on Monday. Uh, it's definitely not butt fumble. It's definitely not Eli Manning finds himself surprised by a Jared Allen sack that he can't see. Um, it's not up there, but it is funny. Um, I got to say, uh, probably just because the moment wasn't that big, relatively like it didn't occur in a playoff game, it's probably not as funny as the Malcolm Butler pick uh, of the Seahawks. Um or the Brandon Bostic uh, screw up against the Seahawks, um, and they've got a lot of funny playoff moments, huh? Um, Fun- yeah, I, I, was I, it funnier than Tony Romo's inability to hold onto the ball? Yeah, I think I think um, I think it's in the same category. I'd still take Tony Romo's like because he was holding on a field goal snap, right, or something like that. Yes. Yeah, I I think I think that's a little bit funnier, but I think it's in the same tier. So to me. That's probably like a six or a seven, maybe. Um, it's the problem is that it, this didn't occur in a playoff game, right? So um, it, it just that reduces the meme ability of it. Um, it is a repeat offense, so that helps. But I think that the fact that I think Roma's occurred in in the first round of the playoffs. It or, did. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Uh, the the snap flying over Peyton's head in the Super Bowl in a in a regular season game. That's like not that funny. It's like kind of funny in the Super Bowl. That's hilarious. Um, so it's just like you took one of those things. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's like maybe a six, possibly a five, just because it's a regular season game. But the repeatability is funny. A reef's neglected resistance bands asks exactly how much merch would I have to buy on Norseco.threadless.com for a reef to acknowledge me? Uh, Russia star pupil is uh, asking what gets brought up more this time of year, Herschel Walker trade or the 91 blizzard? Incredible question. Uh, I think both references are dying in Minnesota pop culture. I think there's just fewer references to the 91 blizzard, which I wasn't even here for. Um, And I just, I feel like Minnesota's played Dallas often enough that the Herschel Walker trade just is kind of uh, old hat, I guess. Um, But both get brought up a lot. I, in my experience, the 91 blizzard gets brought up more because uh, people bring up the 91 blizzard are Vikings fans, uh, but also people bring it up are not necessarily Vikings fans, right? Vikings fans are the only ones that bring up the Herschel Walker trade or at least football fans, right? But both football fans and non-football fans will bring up the the 91 blizzard. So I think that that's kind of the tiebreaker for me. I mean, I heard about it so much growing up as a kid. Um, but I, I think I think it's that. I think it's that, not the Herschel Walker trade. But I, I think it's a good question. I think it's close. And it's going to get brought up more as Herschel Walker 
makes the a run at governorship or something like that. Like he's running for office. So that that could flip back in Herschel Walker's favor very soon. He is doing his best to get back out into the uh into the world. I'm just trying to figure out what he was uh running for here. I believe it's Senate in Georgia. Senate. Oh my god. Okay. Yeah, well that's yep. that's even funnier, honestly, just because of how charged the Senate races in Georgia specifically have been. Um but yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that that's that's good. That's that's hilarious. If you look up his Wikipedia page, it's Herschel Walker's an American retired football player, comma political candidate, comma bobsledder, comma sprinter, comma and mixed martial artist. And all of those things he has spent enough time at where it's justifiable to list it on the things that he's done. That's the best part. I remember watching his MMA fight. I believe it was for Strike Force. Uh, was the name of the company. It was the number two company at the time behind uh, UFC. And Herschel Walker came in for his first fight and just wrestled and beat him. He's like 50. It's like that was kind of unheard of. And then he went off and did it again. And I was like, oh, damn. All right. Yeah, and he was, and he was having real fights, right? Like yeah. Ray Edwards fought like a tomato can, right? But Herschel Walker had like real fights. That's the craziest thing. Yeah. It was uh, it was a bit nuts. Uh, Ryan Menson asks: A recent trend in the English Premier League has been to hire highly specialized coaches to focus exclusively on a very specific aspect of the game, i.e., set piece coaches or throw in coaches. Is there anything where something similar could help give the Vikings an edge? Perhaps a second and long coach, or maybe have Clint solely focus on scripting opening drives where he excels and let someone else coordinate for the rest of the game. Uh, a the idea of a throw-in coach specifically is very funny to me. Um, I love that. I want that job. Um, I'm sure I'd get fired pretty quickly because I don't know very much about throwing in. And obviously, you're coaching the whole team, not just the person that's throwing the ball in. But it is fundamentally very funny. Um, right? Because I mean, you're, you're running basically uh, like pick plays like at the end of NBA games, right? But still, very funny, 100% approve. That cannot be a job where you're clocking 40 hours a week, right? So that's great. Good for throwing coaches. Um, as for the version for the Vikings, I actually think that there should be a special teams coach exclusively focused on kicking. And by that, I both mean kicking mechanics and somebody with like a deep degree in sports psychology, right? Like I, that, like you, sh- you could have a special teams coach for the other 10 players on field goal plays and all of that jazz, right? You can run up your special teams plays. You got to coach, you know, the whole unit to do well. Um, but I think a kicking specialist coach that has both a background in sports psychology and kicking mechanics, I think would be pretty ideal because a lot of kickers already consult private kicking consultants that work on mechanics in the off season, incorporating that into kind of a full season regimen. Cause kickers like they, they're on a pitch count. Like part of the reason that kickers and punters don't practice very much at practice, it's not just because like there's only so much that you can do before it's repetitive. It's more you can't really wear out somebody's leg before they get injured. Uh, And so uh, spending some of that practice time elsewhere doesn't really come with a huge opportunity cost. I think that that would be one thing. Um, As for stuff that sounds more absurd and is obviously a little bit more delightful, a second and long coach would obviously be funny and they would be specializing in second and long and so they would call the right plays on second and long. But we are actually getting there in the NFL because there are coordinators whose only job it is, I shouldn't say coordinators, but there are people who add on to their job red zone coordinator and they only call plays within the red zone. And that's in fact what John D. Filippo was for the Eagles before he got hired by the Vikings. He was the red zone coordinator um, or rather he called plays in the red zone. Um, so you're kind of getting there at some point. Um, I know that um, for the 49ers, uh, there were like six different, like when Harbaugh was there, there were six different elements, uh, involved in the play calling process and they all had their own kind of specialty. Um, that's probably too much, but, uh, other elements, I think, yeah, a, a game management coach where their only job is to be good at clock management. Uh, and they also handle like the challenges and stuff like that because those don't overlap because the time clock management matters, challenges are taken off the board and stuff like that. I think that would be really good. Like, obviously, the coach still has the capability of calling timeouts and stuff like that, but they would primarily use that 
like if the clock is running down and the offense doesn't have their play in or if the defense isn't set or if you have the wrong personnel out there, normal time, that stuff. But when it comes to clock management stuff, it is really up to the clock management coach to get that right. So I think that those are really good areas where you could have a specific coach, but like funny areas like second and long, that also is great. Let's do that. Uh, we could have a pass protection offensive line coach and a run blocking offensive line coach. Yeah, aren't those two married together? Probably. Would you want them to have the same stance coming out of the snap? Yeah, probably. But it's funny. So uh, I like it. I feel like at that point, too, on special teams, especially for kicking, we should just hire like a voodoo priestess. Like if we can just hire a voodoo woman named Phyllis to hang out on the sideline for that. I feel like that could only bring good things to us. Yeah, I think uh, sort of any pagan ritual that you can uh, import into kind of the team's overall philosophy, I think the better. But certainly, I think that the faith family football culture of the NFL would welcome that because it is a faith. I can think of no group that would be more welcoming, quite frankly. And corporate. let's go to Luke Braun, who uh, brings up the corporate aspect of things. Are the Vikings the most corporate team in the NFL? Extremely corporate quarterback, extremely vanilla PR-wise. It literally says a corporate environment <laughs> on the sign into the practice facility. Does any franchise, the entity as a whole, not just the players, have less soul? All right, so the first thing I want to say is that Luke should know that corporations are people and therefore they automatically have a soul. Um, that's been decided by the most venerated institution in the land, the Supreme Court. So uh, you just have to accept it. Corporations have souls. Second, uh, to me, the answer, I think, has to be the Giants. Part of the reason that I pick the Giants over uh, the Vikings uh, is, in part, you still have Mike Zimmer doing Mike Zimmer stuff, so that that like reduces kind of the, the corporate PR feel, the whitewash feel that you get. Um but also, like, the Kirk Cousins being, like, a fairly stodgy quarter. I mean, he literally calls himself a CEO. And he, like, reads CEO motivational books. So I 100% I get where you're coming from. But also, like, there's not a ton of corporations in the sense that we think of, like, Fortune 500 corporations um, that are, like, as willing to wade into the controversy about, say, like, vaccines, right, as Cousins. Um, so there is that. Um but yeah, I think the Vikings are up there. But I, I would take the Giants because Daniel Jones is very much like that. They, that's what they valued about Daniel Jones is that they reminded him of Eli Manning. And there are like pictures of them wearing like the exact same clothing outside, obviously, of football uniform. Um, and it's just like they're all wearing like the pleated khakis and like the button up shirt that's tucked in with the belt. And like it, that's very who they are. Um, Gettleman is a little bit, I wouldn't say like off the cuff, but he's, he's a little bit uh, less corporate. But Joe Judge is super corporate. The whole organization seems super corporate. Um, and uh, the degree to which Gettleman kind of varies from that corporate speak is significantly smaller than the amount that Zimmer veers away from it. And Gettleman has less availability to the media. Zimmer's availability multiple times a week. And so that's just like part of it. So I would say that the, the Giants are up there. Um, probably like if we wanted to include tech bros, like the Cardinals are up there. Like they're a tech bro Silicon Valley corporate environment just because of the way King, uh, Kingsbury operates uh, and how like new wavy they are, but like in a very tech oriented way, like this is more efficient. Um, and then I can't really think of any that are like more corporate than, uh, than, than the giants. Like you could have probably said the Steelers for a while, but I just feel like there's a looseness to them sometimes. Uh, it's not necessarily good, but um you know, you, you get like Mike Tomlin snapping a little bit. You've got, you know, the quarterback that people love to hate. Um, the receivers are always acting out, right? Whether it's Mike Williams or Antonio Brown or Juju Smith-Schuster or whatever, right? Um, but there is kind of a corporateness to the, the Steelers that I think challenges the Vikings in that area. But I think it's it's got to be the Giants as number one. And plus, if you look at the, the stadium that the Giants play in, uh, MetLife Stadium, my first thought when we pulled up to it, uh, uh, when I pulled up to it, it looked like an office building. Um, it did, yeah. The exterior really did, in fact, look like it. So, it uh, there there definitely is that aspect of it to, uh, to it as well. Uh, the rest of the mailbag is going to go uh, completely off topic for those who who are interested. Just letting you know, 
we have reached the last of the really uh, relevant stuff to football, but we still have relevant stuff to Arif and I. Uh, Damian Barrett asks, it's that time of year again for Arif to formally denounce candy corn for the trash it is. His long-standing stance on it's good if you make it properly is the same logic that applies to his turkey hatred as is his I don't eat it because there's better alternatives. Call out his hypocrisy. Arif, you have the floor for uh, let's go one minute. I'm, I'm going to speak longer than a minute, James. Don't even try. Two. Yeah. <laughs> You're on the clock. So, uh, I, sure. So uh, the one thing here is that this doesn't make any sense because I'm saying that they are two completely different products. Candy corn made at home is made of different stuff than candy corn that's sold corporately, which is uh, generally like a food grade wax or, or, or kind of a mallow product that is not the mallow that you make, the mallow cream that you make when you make it at home. It's like saying, I like turkey because this chicken is sometimes called turkey, but I don't like turkey when it is turkey, right? Candy corn has branded itself as a particular product that it is not. So it's not the same thing. Yeah, if turkey is made well, it can taste good. But if you make something equally well, like chicken, it tastes better. That's not the same. These are two completely different products. So I don't really care that, you know, uh, ca- candy corn that's sold uh, like by Brox or whatever is made in product. It's a different product. It's made of different ingredients. So it's just a name thing. If I called uh, some chicken turkey and also called turkey turkey, I would not be hypocritical for me to be like, well, I like the turkey that's chicken. That's a different species. So there's no hypocrisy here. It's just a labeling error. You know, I was expecting to go the full two minutes there. So um, kudos to you. This is the only time I've ever heard of a policy debater not using his time. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I did get more speaker points in a debate because I, I finished halfway through the speech and I decided not to speak more. That, that's how you know you're winning. Oh, is, is that it? Because every time that happened to me in LD, it, uh, it usually spelled disaster. Um, <laughs> but we'll move on. Uh, also from Damian Barrett, I'm spending Christmas in Minnesota and will use the occasion to go to U.S. Bank Stadium for my first time. Should I buy tickets for the game against the Rams now or should I wait until the availability slash price has been influenced by our performance in the upcoming string of games? Yeah, the next four games are like a nightmare. So absolutely wait. And I think that the benefit to waiting is like it's kind of a win-win because if the Vikings are like really good and the price goes up, yeah, you have to pay more, but you're just going to be more excited to go to that game and uh, you won't kind of dread watching the Vikings, which is a very normal thing to do. Um, I would wait, and it is very likely that the Vikings will just seem like a less interesting team by the end of the stretch. Price will drop down, then they'll get to play like the Lions again or whatever, and maybe the price goes back up, and you just kind of want to buy the dip. There you go. Uh, let's go to Nolan Kaler, who asks, did Derrick Henry throw a touchdown pass solely to boost his MVP odds? Yeah, selfish, craven effort from Derrick Henry to call that play. Absolutely. It was fantastic. Also, a question for North Code. Was releasing Weatherly just a cap move to sign Blue Bomber defensive MB- MVP uh, Willie Jefferson? I love the North Code thing because I always have to Google who these people are right before the show or in some cases during the show. Uh, Willie Jefferson, by the way, is 30, uh, but he's currently uh, a really good CFL player. He's a defensive end. He makes like $260,000 a year for the CFL, which is quite a bit uh, CFL-wise, um, but uh, it's probably pretty easy to get him in. He's a pretty good edge rusher. Um, is he the most outstanding defensive player? Uh, he was last year for for the bombers and so uh when he was 29 so yeah bring him in i don't really care that, i mean that sounds good he had like 12 sacks last year in the cfl i guess that's really hard um go ahead he batted down a bunch of passes your analysis sometimes just shocks me and how like was, in depth and yeah prepared. no for sure i definitely wasn't googling it during the question yeah we couldn't hear your mouse clicking at all it was great uh bishop sycamore alumnus asks <laughs> call back to last year's relationship corner those who oh, remember no. this question from last year uh remember how appalled we were at, at at the basis of this so keeping that in mind as the game is happening during the holiday festivities what excuse can i come up with to justify watching the game over the normal halloween activity of decorating the in-laws christmas tree uh, for those who remember from last year, this this poor gentleman is forced against his will to decorate his in laws Christmas tree, and the the their their tradition states that it happens on 
Halloween. I, 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 I just, I don't, I don't, right? Like, I just feel like any excuse you can have to not be part of this tradition is probably fair because this is like in immoral activity that they're, that they're pressing you to do, right? Like you've been, you've been captured off of like a ship and you've been shanghaied into it. Is that a racist term? Probably not. Um, I, that's just like, that's, I can't believe Halloween activity of de- decorating a Christmas tree. War crime. I was going to go with sacrilegious, but, uh, yeah, war crime, war crime also. Well, fits I care here. about war crimes. That's oh, the, the, that, <laughs> you were just questioning as to whether or not Shanghai was a racist term. So I guess I I'm concluded not, that it probably wasn't <laughs> mostly because I just used it and I didn't want to hurt myself. He didn't want me to just, you know, be forced to go back into the edit and write it down and, and you know, whatever. Yeah. This is, this is all being done in the name of me not having to do edit points, which I appreciate. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, I'm the last person you should be asking any relationship questions to, so uh, I'm going to skip over this one and go to Don from Ohio who asks, which member of Vikings Twitter will have the worst Halloween pun during the game Sunday night? Uh, so we discussed this before the show. And I thought Luke Braun was a strong candidate, and I was completely blown away by how wrong I was because James came up with two excellent candidates, one of which is very obvious that I'll name right now, and I'll let James name the other one, and give his argument for why it's actually even odds and not very obviously Ted Glover, who uh, revels in this, um, would absolutely love to fire off some Halloween puns. But uh, there is a strong argument that it may not be him. It, it's, it's true. See, my first thought was that this is a two-horse race. This is either Eric Thompson's uh, fi- one to lose, or it is Ted Glover. The problem is, is that Eric has two, at least two daughters and is going to be busy doing Halloween stuff. The problem is that he has daughters. Well, the problem is, is that he is <laughs> an active father, and as a result, he may be out trick-or-treating with the kids instead of watching the game live. And so not watching the game lives, he may miss an opportunity to throw some of these like gems out there uh, because Eric has been known to throw out some pretty good dad jokes slash slash puns. The other chance is uh, is Ted. And I've, you know, I said earlier today on Twitter that Ted is a strong candidate for this. He may also have one drink too many and, and forget to tweet and just say it aloud. And, and <laughs> just have it, say it aloud. To himself. I have this problem too. I'm getting older and I'm realize I, I say things aloud. I mean, the realization there's nobody in the house. Like why, why isn't anybody here to laugh at this? It sucks. So <laughs> the, all things are possible through Ben DiNucci, but this is a real, I feel like this is a two horse race, but, uh, but Luke is a very strong third party candidate. Yeah, no, I, I think that if you were kind of to try to put your, your money down on like some Leicester City odds, right? Like long odds, it'll pay off. Um, Leicester, I think it's Leicester. Uh, it I think is. Luke Braun is, yeah. I pronounced it correctly like two episodes ago too. Uh, <laughs> I think Luke Braun is, uh, is, is, a, is a good one to kind of throw your money down on. Um, but yeah, I just, the it's Eric Thompson is, is such a good candidate for this. 